and welcome to For the Love of Nature, a podcast where we tell you everything you need to know about nature and probably more than you wanted to know. I'm Laura. And I'm Katie. And today we're going to be talking about animals and how they have some incredible adaptations for eating. And we're back! Season, what, seven? Good lord. Yes, season seven. This is, so it's been two full years. This is the start of the third one. This is ridiculous. (laughs) In the best (laughs) way. It is, but it's also, I know we've talked about this before, like, you and I are both very much so hurry up, pick new hobbies. Hobby jumpers, for sure. Yeah, hobby jumping. Yeah. And and here we are, start of year three, which is ridiculous. It really is because of the novelty of these episodes. It is. No, They're different enough that it's holding my attention. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, yeah, at this point, I normally would be feeling like I have to continue the hobby because I'm not a quitter, but at the same time dreading every time yep. we record that's that would be what it was if it was any other hobby yeah no exactly like the guilt the internal guilt of yeah hey i need to do this but yeah nothing, <laughs> nothing. here we are <laughs> here we are start, start of year three this is yeah again ridiculous but we're happy to be here ridiculous in a good way just because we're shocked that we're still doing this yeah 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 so like katie said we're gonna start things off lightheartedly lighthearted science so not too heavy just talking about some animals and some of their weird adaptations for eating because you know katie and i both love animals and we both love food food i was just talking i think we talked about this on the podcast before how i my like worst food experience was definitely by far eating an earthworm and I just told that story the other day at work, and they all, I just got, like, blank stares. I mean, nobody was shocked. I mean, yeah, so that, yeah. <laughs> but still, everyone was just like, what? I was like, yeah, it's like the sack, and it's so disgusting, but. The sack. Yeah. Yeah, just don't bite down when you eat earthworms, folks. You, uh... learn. So gross. But some of my, well, I think, well, at least one of my animals for sure like to eat them. The other one, just maybe by mistake, but. Alrighty, did you want to go first or? Yeah, sure, Katie, I'll start. So I'm going to start with woodpeckers. Oh, that's a Um, good one. Yeah, I was like, what animal should I talk about? So of course I'm Googling for ideas and then woodpecker showed up. I'm like, oh, yes, because I talk about actually these at work way more often than most people probably do. (laughs) Yeah. Because we've got so many species of woodpeckers in the woods around work and we talk about them a lot. So I learned some new things. I had That's some of my good. own. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I thought I knew everything about woodpeckers, and I so I thought this would be easy. That's pretty. And then, that's pretty lofty. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but I, well, at least I thought I had a pretty good idea about woodpeckers. But turns out everything I knew about them, or almost everything, was a lie. What? Uh, yeah. So you've just been telling the masses lies. Yeah, I didn't know that everything was debunked last summer. So man, people. Straight from science's mouth, let me tell you about woodpeckers. So, what is a woodpecker? There are 239 species of woodpeckers in the world, 23 of which live in the United States. And around me, I think there's like five or six. So, they are insanely specialized birds. They have a million adaptations. I'm only going to be talking about the ones that help them to eat. And they've got more than one, but just... More than one that helps them eat? Yes. Okay, okay. So, you know woodpecker, getting the name for pecking on wood, obvs. They're doing this to eat and for territory and some other things. But just to real quick put things in perspective. So they have to be adapted to be able to do this. They peck 100 to 300 times per minute or up to 20 times per second, (laughs) which is just crazy. Um, Their head is going towards that tree at 23 feet per second. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and when their beak hits Ugh. that tree, Katie, their head experiences 1,200 Gs. What? Which is 14 times more than a human head could. Do, like, how, how, good, get, how good did you fact check yourself here? Uh, I, I, <laughs> multi, multiple sources. Man. Yeah, and they do this 12,000 times per day. On average. I mean, I'm sure that's a guesstimate. I was going to say, because can you imagine? I mean, I know scientists. Yeah, but only like you figure out how fast they go and then you have to be the scientist that follows them around and then time each time. They're like, you know what I mean? And then just uh, calculate it, calculate it time. Definitely an intern's job. Totally an intern job. Definitely an intern. So anyway, what's all that pecking for? Well, 
A lot of it is for food. So their diet, because this is all about eating. So what are they eating? Well, it kind of depends on the woodpecker, but most are insect and seed eaters. Some drink nectar. So the adaptations that they have to do it. Here are a few. First of all, their beak. So like all birds, you can tell what they eat by the way that their beak looks. So, you know, all of you out there, you know, a pelican eats fish because it's got a scooping beak and you know that a hummingbird can drink nectar because it's got a little tiny pointy beak for getting in flowers. Well, the woodpeckers have chisel-like beaks for being able to peck. But some cool things about them and that's unique to woodpeckers is that they can independently move the upper and lower beak. And that is so that when they peck into the tree to get the insects, their beak doesn't get stuck. <laughs> which I don't know why I've never thought about that. They just I've never get thought. stuck. Yeah, like a little dart. <laughs> yeah, right? So uh, they have like a slow-mo video of this online you can look up. But when they stick their beak in, they twist it open to pull it out. They just get enough wiggle room to be able to pull out. Uh, so. Insert so many jokes here. Continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Insert, twist, pull out. <laughs> so this is a maybe, but I did want to mention this. There's a there's ongoing research on woodpecker beaks. Possibly the golden-fronted woodpecker has an upper beak that's slightly longer than the lower beak. Okay. Which theoretically could divert the force, those G-forces, up and over the head. What? And then... Then the beak itself is made of several parts. The outside's keratin, which is like your fingernails. And they're actually made out of little plates like fingernails that overlap a little bit so they could indent a little when they hit. Underneath of that's bone. So although the top beak is longer, the bottom beak's bone inside is longer. So so whatever it has like a to, yeah it has like a recoil like the top one has yeah. more recoil yeah whatever whatever doesn't get deflected over the top then hits the longer bone on the bottom and then is diverted down How the heck do you test that Right so that's that's where that this it's a pretty recent study but from the other information that you're going to hear in a second not sure if it's actually diverting those forces. Yes, it's for sure they had an x-ray. The beak is like that. Yes, Why? yes. We're not sure. That's what they're guessing, though. But they do have a special head for all that pecking to be able to get the stuff that they're eating. Their head is stiffer, and actually, like, the skull itself, the bone is stiffer because it's made out of different minerals than a lot of other birds' hmm. skulls, but it's still really thin, so it's, you know, can still fly. And it has less fluid around its little tiny brain. It has less so, fluid? Yeah. So, because huh. they don't want it to slosh. Okay. So the only reason why these tiny little guys aren't getting concussions everywhere they go, mostly is because of the less fluid thing around the brain. Their brain can't go anywhere. Like, our you would brain, we get still think that that has sloshes. to, yeah, but you would still think that that has to hurt. Yeah, yeah, okay. So <laughs> I mean, here's regardless. Where I, here's where I've been lied to my whole life, and where I've been telling all the kids up until this week, <laughs> is that woodpeckers have shock, shock absorbing heads. Well, yeah, because that's okay. what we were all, yeah, that's, I think that's whenever we were all, well, I yes. want to say kids, but that's, that is what I, we I were I think taught. that's always been the theory. Yeah. Because of, there's a lot of adaptations that it has that looks like that. Would it, that's what it would do. But, boom, debunked last summer. So this other guy was like, there's no way that that happens. If they had a shock-absorbing head, then they would have to be pecking harder and longer. Because you don't have a shock-absorbing hammer that yeah. would require you to do more work. Yeah. And the bird doesn't want to do more work because that's more energy. So he was like, I'm going to make sure that's true, but I don't think that it does. So there's all he took all these videos of captive woodpeckers, and he... Can't see the brain moving inside, okay? But if it's a shock-absorbing head, then the beak and the brain would be moving at different times. Yeah. Because that brain would be delayed. Yeah. Can't see the brain, but you can see the eyeball. And the eyeball is directly next to a, the brain in a woodpecker. So the eyeball then theoretically would be moving slower. In no woodpecker did that happen. <laughs> so therefore, probably not a shock-absorbing head. They're just taking that full 1,200 Gs. <laughs> so maybe they you know, really are just like dumb birds they're just like gotta well, get the worms gotta get the worms yeah <laughs> so a no fluid around the brain that helps but also he thinks that the main reason why that they're not getting the concussions is the fact that their brains are 700 times smaller than ours I, and something that's tiny <laughs> can be hit much harder than something big 
he used the example of a fly hitting a window would True. absolutely kill us. Yeah. But the fly is like, whatever, and keeps flying. <laughs> yeah. So the woodpecker, would they did like a computer model, and it would have to be hitting at least twice as hard on wood. Which is okay. ridiculous. And it would ha- okay, it's not hitting 12 Gs or whatever. That's not hard enough. You right, not I mean? hard enough. On wood. Yeah. The Great. caveat there is if once they start, you know, I have definitely heard them hitting metal. And that yeah. is enough to give them a concussion. Interesting. They've also found, like, dead woodpeckers that they've done necropsies on, uh-huh. and they've got a lot of proteins in their brains, which happens to humans when we get concussions. Yep, yep. So, if it's the same with birds, then <laughs> actually all woodpeckers, they all are. Yeah. They're just dealing with it and probably die before it ever becomes a problem. Interesting. So, it's just a bunch of brain damage yeah. to woodpeckers out there, which is kind of <gasps> sad, but I just couldn't believe it. I was like, what? Their head's not shotgun. I've like, been lied have, to! They have, well, they have, like, a... Sp- Spongy, it looked like a spongy bone. There's all this other stuff. Yeah. So, no. So they've got the specialized head. They've got a specialized chisel beak. They have a an extremely thick inner eyelid so that their eye doesn't pop out of their head on impact. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> Get um, Bill's eye again, like, yeah, every time. Gosh, gosh dang it. <laughs> Not again. So they got an extra thick eyelid. They have strong neck an muscles extra, to be able to do that. An extra thick eyelid. Well, I'm sure because they probably have to, you know, they have to shoot the eyeball, but they probably have to keep their eyes open to be able to see. So they have that extra eyelid, like that third one that a yeah, lot of yeah. animals do. It just happens to be extra. It's like welding goggles <laughs> just to, to keep the eyeball inside. <laughs> Oh, um, poor woodpeckers. Yeah. They have really strong neck muscles. And then last but not least is the tongue, which is actually why I did this animal. Because I think the tongue alone is the coolest part of the adaptation for eating. So all of the rest was so that it could peck into the tree to get the food. The tongue is how it's actually getting it. The woodpecker tongues are super long. Okay. Like at it's work, un- I was it's so- uncomfortably long compared to their yeah. body. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like Gene Simmons has nothing yeah. on a woodpecker. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> at work, I always tell the kids to stick them out as far as they can, and then I'm like, "Too bad, woodpeckers can do it further." Yeah. And so, just like other animals, their tongue is attached to a hyoid bone. In us, if you pinch your throat, you can kind of feel that hard hyoid bone like halfway down your neck. That's what your tongue's attached to. In a woodpecker, that same thing, but that bone is up in their right nostril. (laughs) Okay? Or right above their right nostril. Then Uh, the tongue goes up and over their head, splits into a V around the back of the head, Mm -hmm. and then joins back once again when it hits the mouth to then go out. Okay? Again, excessive. Yeah, really? But again, you would think that this could then cushion the head. That's not what it's doing, though. It's just storage. It just needs extra storage for that insanely long tongue. It has to start somewhere. So rather than coming up and making loops around the throat, it's just like, screw it. We'll start from around, we'll start up around the nose, come back around the head, and then just... But, okay, but from, like, an evolution adaptation perspective, like, what the heck? You know I what agree. I mean? I think it seems like it would be much more likely for that bone to migrate down, down. than up around the back of the skull to the nose. Okay. Yeah, that just isn't... Yeah, that seems weird to me. It had to have slowly moved up. I I don't know. Maybe one um, sneezed too hard one day, or it just hit (laughs) its head a little too hard, and it, like, jostled... all the jarring. Yeah, just jostled the wrong way, and that's how it got its tongue up and around its head. Just oopsie. Whoops. Uh, (laughs) Oops. So when their muscles contract, the tongue sticks out, and when the muscles relax, the tongue goes back in. And that tongue can be up to a third the length of that little bird's body. Um... (laughs) With the longest one being the, the in a, at least in North America, is the flicker. It's got a tongue that sticks two inches past its beak, which is pretty long for a bird that's not, you know. Right, huge. yeah. And all that, why does it even need that tongue, is because of its feeding habits. So remember I said that it can either eat insects or seeds sometimes or nectar. So depending on what it's eating, the tongue has a different end or is a little bit different. So the flicker tongue is very much like an ant eater because they specialize in eating ants. So they're long and smooth and extra sticky. So they got the longest one because they need to stick their tongue down those little anthills like a noodle and just slurp it around. And then a, something like the pileated or pileated has barbs on the end of their tongue. Yeah, so that one I knew. So it's not very long. Yeah. It just needs to stick it in a crack of the bark, spear some beetle larva, and slurp them up. 
And then this yellow-bellied sapsucker, which doesn't even sound like a real bird, they're drinking nectar. So their tongue actually has like tiny little bristles all along the bottom. So it uses like capillary action and just kind of like sucks up the nectar on their tongue. So depends, the tongue depends on the diet. But it all comes down to the fact that they're eating some really specialized stuff and they are completely adapted to eat that. My money for the ivory-billed woodpecker, if it is still around, would have I mean, to be like a some pe- adaptations for survival, man. Yeah, right. Like hide and go seek skills. One, two, <laughs> two. They would. Ha- it would have to. I would assume it would be more like a pileated because I mean, one, everybody mistakes oh, yeah. oh, ivory yeah. bill for pileated. For those of you who don't know, ivory bill woodpeckers have may or may not be completely extinct. Um, but very recently, um, once they finally declared that it was officially extinct, people have been saying that they're spotting them. And I mean, and it's not just, you know, Joe Schmo out there birding. Because now, <laughs> once as soon as they officially announce that they're extinct, like, birders went nuts. And they're like, no, no, they are not. And so everybody went out and tried to start looking for it and stuff. And so it, it is... Very, very, very similar to a pileated woodpecker, which they oh, are yeah, they huge so birds. Yeah, they're yeah. huge birds too. Well, I mean, huge birds for a woodpecker. So anyway, so my guess would be ivory, and ivory bill woodpeckers are in like southeastern, like te- like I don't even think they're in Texas quite. Maybe in some of the swamps or used to be Arkansas, Louisiana, all the way over to Florida. And I think most of the more recent sightings have been uh, Arkansas and then Florida. Just like remote areas probably. Yeah, yeah very, re- very remote areas. Yeah, so my money would be on something more like a pileated. Yeah, probably they're eating the larva of the trees. And hide and go seek. <laughs> just. <laughs> they just, too many of them got concussions. That's what right? ended up happening. Right, right. Good. Uh, so yeah, that's the woodpecker. I love them, and now I'm going to tell kids the right facts. Now, I've been um, <laughs> sorry, kids, if you've heard me give this talk before, it's going to be a completely new talk because yeah. everything I said was wrong. The tongue, it's accurate, but the reasons for it, none of it has to do with shock none absorbing. It. It's yeah. all a lie. Oh, uh, Laura, liar, liar <laughs> to children. Uh, all right. So the first animal that I'm going to talk about in their unique adaptations. Um, Again, this shouldn't be surprising, but I'm going to talk about a platypus. Yay! I think we've talked about a platypus before, but I don't remember what it was. I it was me. It was you fighting, right? It was oh, something. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, with the spurs yeah, and the stuff. Spurs. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we've already venom. That was what that's it was. what it was. The venom, the venom one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so the platypus is a strange animal, morphologically speaking, of course. It's. Uh, I think I was reading a story like when they first found it. And they described it as like they they really didn't know, and so they cut they caught one. They sent it back to to England to be like, "What the heck is this?" Because yeah. they didn't know what the. I mean, it would a bird. Is yeah, it a mammal? I, I don't is know it a fish. Yeah, is it a- don't know what this is. So they're only found in eastern Australia, and they are a semi aquatic mammal that is known for its duck like bill, which is what we're gonna dive into later. Get it? <laughs> yeah. uh, their web feet and the fact that it is only one of the two only mammals in the world that lay eggs. When they do lay eggs, it's generally between one one to three eggs. So in terms of size, the adult platypus can grow up to about 20 inches in length and weigh about four and a half pounds. Their web feet can help them be quick swimming and they can go as fast upwards of one meter per second at a top speed, which is about 2.2 miles an hour. That's pretty good. Well, I mean, if you get That's close enough there. to where one, I mean, the best thing you could do is like briskly walk away. Yeah. Because yeah. two point two miles an hour for us is <laughs> That's true. is not that fast for them. I'm sure that it's like a squirrel. They think they're going really fast. <laughs> I but, don't know why I always think about platypuses being otter sized, and they're not. No, they're, they're so much smaller. They're small. They are very small. Again, so I'm not surprised. bragging or anything, but I have seen one in the wild, and I was the only one of the class to see it besides the professor, who was like, "Hey, look, platypus," and I had. Already happened to be looking out the window. Yeah. Right at the same. So I got super, super lucky. Anyway, for the most part, they are found in freshwater streams, creeks, and rivers, as well as in swamps, lakes, lagoons, where they spend most of their time in the water hunting for food. They will occasionally venture into brackish water, but it is very rare. So one of the most fascinating and little known facts about the platypus is its ability to detect electric fields. It has sensitive receptors in its bill. So it's not, you know, Bill's just not because it got confused and wanted to be a duck. 
It allows it to locate and capture its prey, even in complete darkness. One, they're nocturnal. They're mainly nocturnal, so that's one. Yeah. But not only this, but platypus, when they go into the water, they close their eyes, nose, and ears when they swim. That seems ridiculous. Why right? would they not have the nictitating membrane thing? Because that's what they choose to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so, I mean, which is kind of like how my sister swims, because that's how she always was yeah. as a kid. She, like, closes her nose, like, eyes. Nose. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. weirdos. I'm just a platypus. Don't judge me. I mean, to be fair, uh, evolution speaking, if a platypus is going to do that, it would have to have some sort of adaptation. Well, right. It's just wandering around a little blind guy in the yeah, water, right? just hoping to find fish. Yeah. So, uh, but, it's eating. but to be fair, if you're going to be hunting in the water at night, everything's black anyway. So I guess you might as so well what's the point? Yeah, close your eyes and hope your other <laughs> senses kick in, I guess. But they mostly hunt small aquatic animals such as crustaceans and fish, which gener- which do generate a weak electric fields as they move through the water. So how do they actually do this? So this unique adaptation allows a platypus to locate its prey with incredible accuracy, even in the murkiest pitch black waters. It does not matter. One, I mean, again, they have their eyes closed, so none They're of like it. like a shark, right? Don't shark have this ability with the electric? Yeah, to to some extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, they definitely do. But not I don't I don't think it's the same I don't think it's the same setup. Okay. I'll have to I'll have to look. But scientists believe that the platypus is able to detect electric fields as weak as five microvolts, which is about a million times weaker than the electric fields that we can detect with our fingers. Wait, sorry, say that number one more time for me. Five microvolts, which is about a million times weaker than an electric, yeah, than what we could feel a hum, like I guess like a hum. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So how does it do it? The bill, which is a super sensory organ, is made up of three distinctly different receptor cells that help the platypus detect movements and subtle electric fields produced by its prey. It has 60,000 push rod mechano receptors on the bill that detect changes in pressure and motion while an additional 40,000 of two different types of electro receptors track the electrical signals produced by the muscular contractions of small prey in comparison a human adult has anywhere from two to four thousand taste buds on our tongue and so they have over a hundred thousand on their tiny little bills of receptors Can- you know, already how sensitive, like, our fingers are, like, the most sensitive part of our entire body. Okay. Yeah. And already, it's a million times stronger than the most sensitive part of our body. Yeah. And yeah. then, do you think that it, if their bills are that sensitive, with not just electric, mechanoreceptors being any touch at all. Yeah. Like, do, how is it not painful for them to just exist? If they bump their beak at all, are they just, like, if they just I mean, not necessarily, thing? though, because, I mean, you f- you figure, like, with like our tongue, you know what I mean? Like it, yeah. it you know what I mean? It's not, I don't want to say it's desensitized, but it's used to yeah. taking a certain amount of stimuli all the time anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. used to it. And so I think to some extent, it's just, it's just got to used to it. So they will, the platypus, as they're hunting, they will use a, like kind of like a side to side motion of its head And it gauges the direction and distance of its next meal by collecting, combining the flows of the sensory information. So as it's going, it's moving its head side to side. It's collecting all this information. It's making a little map in its head. Basically. Basically. And it it goes side to side, left to right, because the receptors on the platypus's bill are striped from front to back. So they're all lined up in a row. So and it's one line of uh, electroreceptors, one line of mechanoreceptors, one line of electro, one line of mechanical, and so like they alternate. And so it's like their receptors lines are perpendicular to the way it's moving its head. So it's getting it's insane precision. Yes, yes. So because it's crossing, they're making like crosshairs every time they're feeding it. That's crazy. And what's also cool is this stripe pattern, this back and forth stripe pattern is also matches what's like a semi stripe pattern in their brain as well of like receptors. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So it all just literally lines up. But um, Gosh. Yep. And so these findings all came from a researcher fairly recently called, or his name is Jack Pettigrew. He's an Australian neuroscientist who I believe passed away in 2019. But he proposed that the sensory cortex, there are neurons 
that sit. Now, this is talking about the brain. There are neurons that sit on the border of the, sh- like, the stripes in the, wait, hold on. Yeah, in their brain. So, talking about the brain. He said that the neurons don't respond to any particular form of sensory information, but rather they are connected to both the electrical receptor and the mechanoreceptor neighbors, which is what he called the bimodal neurons. So some bimodal neurons get excited when the electrical and mechanical inputs are close together in time. Some get excited when the inputs are far apart in time. And they exist this way on a spectrum. So let me put that into me terms. Because I had to read that like four times when I first was reading it. So what does it mean? All right. So say a fish is relatively far away from a platypus. The electric current that that fish is giving off from as it's moving is from the muscles of its flapping fins, which can travel at a faster frequency than the mechanical distribu- dis- disruption Sorry, disruption of the water. So the time between the two inputs that the platypus is getting would be a longer one if it's farther away. As the fish swims closer, the signals would obviously get closer and closer together in time. And so because, does that make sense? Like as it's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if Pettigrew's bimodal neurons do exist within the platypus's hand, which he has very strong evidence that it does, the platypus would be able to judge then the distance of its prey based on the time differences between the two signals. And so it's able to estimate how far away it is because of like the length of time. Like it's, they're smart enough to be like, oh, I can tell how far away it is because of how quick those sensors are coming in. What's so interesting is that this is from my understanding. I was watching a YouTube video once from this really awesome guy, and he was showing how eyes work. And our Mm -hmm. eyes work very similar in the fact that there are levels where neurons are firing off and, like, combinations make this neuron fire and combinations make this neuron. So we are doing that with our eyes. Since they're not using their eyes, they're doing the exact same mechanics but with their in bill. place of eyes. Yes. Good, they don't need them anyway because they're in pitch black right. water at no, night. it's just really cool that it's like they're literally seeing – they're, they're with just, their it's bill. the same pathway. Yeah, yeah, it's the same pathway. And there are, like you were just saying about humans, and there are different sensory systems, sensory systems across several different species that would exhibit this sort of same system. But it just happens to be that platypus are – incredibly accurate for how tiny they are yeah so besides that in addition to hunting the platypus also uses its ability to detect electric fields for other activities such as communication and navigation for example platypuses use their electric sense to communicate with each other and detect the presence of other platypuses in the area so based upon the size like it can tell size it can tell distance and all that stuff and i guess it just again kind of like a bat can pick up on the size, location, how far away it is, and things like that, and kind of make a mental picture of what it is that's coming closest to it. If they're a predator, why don't they have teeth? Is I guess because they need space for those neurons, so it's a beak. I mean, I, you figure though that the where they live, there is much, much bigger animals, and so the niche that they're filling, yeah, they wouldn't. If they did have teeth, if they were a bigger carnivore. Or if they were needed to be a carnivore, they'd probably be a little bit bigger over time. And there's already all those niches that are yeah. filled in Australia. And so they do fill a very particular niche. And they, I don't want to say they dominate it, but I mean. Yeah. Yeah, it's either that or maybe, the, yeah, they just need the surface area. Like they couldn't do the same thing with teeth. They need the beak for the surface area for the neurons. They wouldn't be as efficient hunters. If yeah. They had and I mean, I mean, why you why waste your energy time building teeth you know adapting teeth you know what i mean if it's e- it's yeah. eating it's getting what it needs you know what yeah. i mean it's going to put all that into the, the sensory system so anyway so the platypus is really a crazy and unique animal i mean besides everything else that makes it well, interesting right. and unique yeah, yeah. <laughs> um the b- whole build thing is just is just crazy so yeah yeah so that's the platypus yeah okay my last one also feel like i've heard of this animal but know nothing about it there, again, another animal that has some really cool adaptations that I'm not going to cover today. We should probably cover in a future episode. I'm just going to do their eating ones. And it's the hagfish. There are 76 species of them. They all live in cold water. Oh. They look like eels. Why that many? Oh, I don't know. I you, Right. I, I don't know. 
They look like eels, but they're not. They're a species of jawless fish, which is, you know, they're cousins of lampreys. So, Another disgusting animal. <laughs> <laughs> they have a skull, but no vertebra. So they're not true vertebrates. They're like an in-between hmm. animal. They don't really count as any, they're like a proto-vertebrate or something like that. They have no true eyes. They're up to a meter long. And they just look gross, dude. If you they look do. at the picture. No, they really do. They have loose, scaleless skin, okay? They just, they look pretty phallic. <laughs> they're and just, yeah. they're pink to blue-gray in color. Just fleshy. It's nasty. It is. Um, no, that's what I'm saying. Like, they're one of the worst off animals. So, what do they eat? Because, again, their diet always, you know, adaptations are made for that diet. So they eat some fish and crustaceans and worms. So they're a little bit carnivorous. But mostly they're opportunistic scavengers. Meaning dead stuff. Manna from heaven that falls to the ocean. It, exactly. Floor. That's what I say. When you're that gross looking, you just take what you can get. <laughs> um, they can eat several times their own weight. Uh, jealous. Ugh. And uh, <laughs> things don't have to be dead for them to start on. Which is awful. I remember that because isn't lam- aren't lampreys the same way? I think lampreys though are like almost more parasitic. Okay, uh, so yeah, I think true. the difference. So the la- lampreys, I'm pretty sure, latch on like a they parasite do. and feed from the outside, which is so disgusting. Hagfish are worse. Okay. Oh no! Listen to this quote. First of all, God bless the scientist that said this. This is from Science Magazine. People quote. When they come across a dead fish, they snuggle their sinewy bodies into its cavities and stay there, writhing blissfully. (laughs) End quote. (laughs) Because they eat things from the inside out. That's so disgusting. So they're not just holding on to the outside. They burrow in and eat it all. And they're snuggling their... I just... The whole thing, it's too good. So how are they adapted to do this? First of all, they're nightmare tongues. Ugh. Again, listeners, you're just going to have to Google a picture because I'm never going to be able to paint this picture as horrifically as it, it is. It is, yeah. They have like a rasping tongue, actually kind of like mollusks, like snails and slugs. A little bit different. So they have two tooth-like rasps on top of their basically a tongue. They like invert, no, evert, invert <laughs> their mouth. Whatever turning inside out is, bleh, it out, and on it are like two lines of li- basically teeth that they lick and like fast and hard enough to <laughs> tear flesh off. So first you have the woodpecker with the excellent long tongue. I don't, right, I'm so sorry everyone, I don't know what it is with me and tongue, I'm just fascinated. <laughs> okay, the killer tongues over here now. Yeah. The, when they pull back on the tongue... <laughs> it gets so much worse because it's not that they're just licking off the flesh. When they, pull it back, when they pull it back in, it pinches together and that's what rips and tears. <laughs> oh, that's so gross. Yeah. And to get extra leverage because they're in the water and it's not like they can hold on to anything. They hold on to themselves because they tie themselves in knots to give themselves an extra purchase to rip faster. <laughs> so... They need, they're doing tongue. such a, a fantastic job of licking. They need to hold. Yeah, they need to hold very on. Enthusiastic yeah, about it. They need to so hold on. Brace yourselves. They lick a hole into the cavity of the living or dead creature um, that they're getting inside of. You, it's got to be like a a partially dead creature. You know what I mean? Oh, it can't, yeah, it's yeah, not completely yeah, yeah, yeah. No alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. up with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The intense licking. <laughs> It's not consensual by any means. Not at all. God, um, so gross. So then now we get to the skin. Okay. So their loose skin that I mentioned before <sighs> helps them to wriggle into spaces less than half their width. So, okay. So they can wriggle on in there. And they, they, they just they keep do getting that grosser. Because there's not, there's, they've got so much essentially wiggle room in their skin. The blood under the skin. So they've got like basically a fluid filled pouch around their muscles you know it's like substance and then just blood and then skin that's so so gross when they wedge themselves in a hole the blood all gets squeezed like a toothpaste tube to the end of their tails (laughs) 
So scientists said that you can, when you see them, sometimes their tails will be really engorged as they're squeezing through. But it doesn't pop. I don't know why. I guess it just redistributes. But Well, yeah, because um, I guess it's, it's almost like one of those things, like, it will all pull to the back, and then as it goes inside, it, like, whoop, actually, yeah. yeah, like, yeah, all like the blood then goes. tubes that you shake. Yeah. Like. <laughs> yeah. The squeezy tubes things, yeah. Yeah. The skin also has, it's loose for other reasons, like avoiding predators and stuff, but that's how it helps it to eat it, by getting inside of the stuff it's eating. Gotta um, be slick then, if you're gonna go that deep inside something. Literally. Because <laughs> um, it is very <laughs> slick and slippery. It's actually, the thing I'm not gonna talk about today, but I want to so badly, is its mucus that it can produce. <sighs> Another day, guys. Their skin is also nutrient absorbing, which is very useful. So once okay. they once they're inside, so the, the reason they're going inside is because they've got no defense. They have very little defenses, so they're just going to hang out inside the corpse to protect themselves from <laughs> stuff that else is coming to eat it. So they hang out in there. Once they've eaten more than their body weight, there's still stuff left, so they're not going to waste it. So their skin just lets nutrients through. So when they can't eat anymore, they just absorb it. The salt concentration of their tissues is the same as the surrounding water, so dissolved nutrients can flow through the skin. But it's very selective. It will only let nutrients in. It's not letting anything. Like, they've done some tests with radi- radioactive substances, and hmm. they can see that, like, the cool. skin is like, you can come through, not you. Like, yeah, bouncer interesting. Skin. Um, And then lastly, these guys, because they are opportunistic scavengers and there actually isn't as much stuff falling to the ocean floor as one would think. They're able to go months without eating. That's what I was going to say. carcasses are so rare. That's what I was going to say. Like, I, I did know that, that I knew that because they would have to gorge so much, you know what I mean? Like, there has, yeah. to, has to be a time frame of just, like, I because don't need to eat like, now. it's feast or famine, baby. Yeah. Ugh. And, yeah, so if you need a little nightmare fuel, listener, just Google hagfish feeding. And it's so And that'll do it. Yeah. yeah, that'll 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 give you the nightmares, or a, or a la- or a lamprey mouth, or a lamprey yeah. mouth. Yeah, yeah. Just, I ugh. mean, they're they're pretty disgusting, but in a really like train wreck way. Like you just gotta look at them and learn more about them. Ugh, they're pretty cool. No thanks. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> you did that one. That's the hagfish. Gross. All right. Well, my second one you actually already briefly mentioned in your first one. I'm gonna do the, the pelican. Oh, what are the chances? Right? Well, I mean, it's a good We're all, yeah, it's bird. Us, though, too. And and to be fair, like, your default is always going to be big cats or bears. My default always seems to be birds or anything Australia. from Australia. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> bound to happen here. All right, so pelicans, they are large water birds that are found in warm and tropical regions all over the world. There are eight different species of pelicans. They are known for their large bill, of course, and the distinctive throat pouch, which is used for catching prey. But before we get into the details of like their hunting and everything like that, I do want to give a shout out to a pelican's epic feather do, like their hairdo. If you've never seen a pelican, it almost looks like they have like hair feathers. Just look up. <laughs> Look up like pelican hairdos because some pelicans have some epic, epic, yeah, hairdos or feather dos. So pelicans, they are quite, they're quite large. And if you've ever seen like a group of pelicans flying, because they are like, they're not like an albatross is huge, but they're like wings are huge. Like, yeah, Yeah. but like pelicans are just like big birds. Like like, tiny planes flying. No, they do. They are pretty dang big. Their wingspan can reach up to about nine feet, making them one of the largest flying birds in the world. Yep. They breed in colonies, and the male pelican will build a nest out of sticks and debris and then present the nest to the female. Like, like, here you go. I mean, which makes sense because have a nice place for your woman. I get it. After mating, the female will lay one to three eggs, and both parents will take turns incubating the eggs and caring for the chicks. And that's that. All right, so let's go back to their throat pouch. Yeah, uh, I feel like I, there's, like, videos all over the internet of pelicans just trying to eat everything. Of everything, yeah. Which is, I mean, if you haven't seen pelicans eat stuff yet, just just YouTube. It's just, yeah, like Laura said, just all kinds of weird things that, again, it's a bird. They're if not... If it fits, I'll <laughs> eat it. Yeah, they're not... <laughs> birds just aren't always the most intelligent creatures out there. So they're found in many different habitats, including mostly the times you'll see them in coastal areas, freshwater, large freshwater lakes, and sometimes rivers. They are also found in many different countries, including the U.S., Mexico, South America, Africa, and Australia. 
Now, I did, I will say one disclaimer. I came across several sources out there that claim that pelicans cannot be found in South America, which is completely false because there's an entire species called the Peruvian pelican. So, yeah, what but I'm heck? talking like several, several sources that said that weird. they can't be found in South America. So weird. But so if anywhere, if you're traveling to any one of those areas, you know, they're not found in anywhere really cool. They typically will send like stay in the tropic area and then just a little bit farther north. You'll be able to see pelicans if you're coastal areas for the most part or the, like the Great Lakes. So like the larger lakes. Yeah. All right, so the hunting techniques and their adaptation they have developed for eating is their most distinct characteristic, and that's that throat pouch, a.k.a. the guler pouch, which they use to catch fish. Now, there are several birds which have that guler pouch, and they have adapted that skin pouch for whatever they need. Some blow it up like a balloon. Some use it to look beautiful to attract a mate. Some use it to hold food for babies, just transporting it back to the nest. And some even use it as like an air conditioner. Okay, so a pelican, most of the time, out of all those ones that I listed, they'll mostly use it to catch fish, and then a few of the species will actively use it to attract mate, or attract mates. There's one, I believe it was in California, that like cha- like drastically changes the color of its skin cool. from like yellow to red. So it's like a complete change, depending yeah. on like breeding season or non-breeding season. The pouch is located under their bill and can expand to hold up to three gallons of water. Now, in size comparison, that would be like us carrying around a gallon of milk in our mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, which is... A, don't a, try it, people. Don't, don't try it. it, but that is a lot. When a pelican spots a fish, it'll dive into the water, open up its bottom bill, scoop up the fish and the water, and then the water drains out through the sides of the bill to like tilt its head down a little bit spits out all the oh it doesn't spit it just lets it drain all out like <laughs> contracts it it just kind of like drooling no, I, I just i've done it like <clears throat> I've, I've definitely seen kids do that before you just right <laughs> yeah <laughs> straight through your teeth right and that's basically what a, a pelican does it drains the water out through the sides of the bill leaving Laura was doing it just today with see grapes. Eg- exactly <laughs> all they have left in there is the fish that are trapped in the pouch <laughs> and that's it and they just eat it so it's kind of like reverse reverse jenga it's yeah well, fish. Like, I, they've just been like screw precision man i just yeah. gotta get the generic area of water close enough and yeah I have the fish do close enough yeah every pelican oh, fish are like trying to be like right on the money and pelicans are like Ever. whatever yeah <laughs> close <laughs> enough um <laughs> So every pelican will hunt and use that pouch differently. I'm like the brown pelican will dive, like dive into the water or dive most of the way into the water and scoop while others. Can you imagine like, the resistance? Like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> water's freaking heavy. No, it is three gallons worth of it. Yeah. That's again, that pounds a gallon, 24 pounds. I mean, again, that would be like us carrying around. I mean, imagine having that our cheeks could expand to hold a gallon of water. But just the force, like even of yeah. dragging your closed hand through the water. Like, much less... Carrying unmet, it, yeah. Like a... A bag. A bag. An Ikea bag, because that's that's pretty big. You know <laughs> what I mean? The Ikea, like, shopping bags? Yeah. That's essentially just what it is. diving it, like, just scoop water as fast as you can with one of those. That would be so heavy. It would be heavy. Yeah. So, brown pelicans, they mostly dive and scoop, while other ones, like the American white pelican, they will just kind of, like, float and then just scoop. So it's like seems more efficient. Yeah, and so there's like, two, I guess brown pelicans are like, let's do this and just like head dive yeah, straight, yeah. straight in. Junkies of, of yeah. pelicans. And American white pelicans are like, you know what? Let's just take the calmer route. Let's just kind of float. <laughs> They'll eventually come to me. We're good. Now, while the pelicans they have the pouch adaptation for catching, uh, it would be a useless tool if it can't. Do the job. Like, I mean, yeah, I can see, yeah, but it can a hole in it. I guess how it depends on how substantial of a hole. Yeah. I mean, this is <laughs> it's like a leaky balloon, just a tiny little. So, if they had just that scoop, but they couldn't catch the fish, it'd be pretty useless, right? So, pelicans, they are known for their cooperative hunting techniques where a group of pelicans will work together to herd the fish under like a tight fish ball, kind of like what right, dolphins or other things do. And then they take time, turns going down and scooping up. And so, they herd all the fish together, like chase whether they go under the water and kind of like 
I don't scare them into a ball, yep. kind of hurt them into a ball, and then they take turns scooping. So I'll get enough. Um, so anyway, so those that's the pelican. All righty, guys. Well, uh, that is all about the animals and the insane adaptations that they have gained from eating. Make sure that you follow us on Twitter and support us on Patreon. And join us next week. You know, new season. We've got plenty more exciting stuff to do. Now that you know more than you wanted to know, your curiosity should be piqued, and hopefully you care just a little bit more. Talk to you all next week. Bye.